Thank you so much. And thank you to the Leakey Foundation for inviting me to give this presentation. And thank you to everyone in the audience for being here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today on my view on engaging public audience, engaging with public audiences on human evolution. Um, and a quick overview of what I'll talk about. I'm going to give a little bit of data on US public acceptance of human evolution. I'll talk about our approach to public engagement on human evolution at the Smithsonian. And then I'm going to give three examples of that approach. Our on-site public programs, our traveling library exhibit, and a high school biology curriculum project. And I'm gonna end by um, telling two stories, two anecdotes to illustrate how I put this approach into action. So um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about my research first. Um, as you heard in the introduction, I'm a paleoanthropologist who studies human dietary evolution. I use zooarchaeological and taphonomic methods. So basically I look at modern and fossil animal bones that have marks on them left by stone knives from people butchering them or tooth marks or chewing damage from being munched by carnivores. Um, and the photos you see here on the left, I'm squatting in a hippo footprint at the field site of Alorga Sile in southern Kenya, um, which has been run by Greg Poss, the director of the Human Origins Program for several decades and where I've also been doing research. Um, the middle photo is of me actually quite pregnant doing field work before my son was born in 2011. Um, at Alpejeta Conservancy in central Kenya, where I now run um, a modern taphonomy project. And on the right, I had the privilege of studying the original Turconoboy skeleton, looking to see if any cars of carnivores have munched on him. Um, so, but I really want to talk about my outreach. Um, so much of my role at the Smithsonian includes outreach. Um, this includes managing the human origins programs, on-site public programs, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, I lead development of content for our website, which is humanorigins.si.edu. I administer two social media accounts. We have a Facebook and Twitter account. Um, you can also follow me personally at Brianna Povener on Twitter. And I lead content training for volunteers in the Hall of Human Origins, as well as museum-wide volunteer content training for all um, National Museum of Natural History volunteers in topics like engaging with visitors on controversial in quote science topics like evolution and climate change. What I won't really get a chance to mention today is the outreach that I also do internationally. Because I'm involved with multiple long-term projects, particularly in Kenya, I focus a lot of my efforts there, beginning with participating in a workshop for teachers and museum educators led by the National Museums of Kenya, which I think was in 2007. Um, so, for example, currently I'm collaborating with Dr. Habiba Chirchir from Marshall University, who you will want to catch at an upcoming Lunch Break Science Talk on July 1st. We're doing workshops for high school biology teachers in rural Kenya. I'm working with the National Museums of Kenya Education Department, the Smithsonian's Office of International Relations, and um, George Washington University PhD student Ryan McRae on developing new school programs for the National Museums of Kenya centered on Kenyan prehistory topics. The photo here is from the summer of 2019. So I work on the long-term Smithsonian research project I mentioned at Alorga Sile in Southern Kenya, um, led by Dr. Rick Potts, the director of the Human Origins Program. And we excavate on land that belongs to members of the Maasai community. Um, that summer, Rick organized a trip for several elders and other leaders from the Maasai community to visit the National Museums of Kenya Paleontology Division to see where the Alorga Sile fossils are stored and how well they're cared for. I really enjoyed participating in this experience, which is just a part of Rick's and my, um, the Smithsonian's significant efforts to engage the local community in the Alorga Sile area. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of data on um, US acceptance of human evolution. Um, and I think about this because I think about the audiences who will be coming into the Hall of Human Origins, um, which was mentioned in the introduction that I helped put together and I helped keep, keep up to date. Um, our exhibit opened in 2010, and this is a permanent exhibit. And so while our museum audience is both national and international, um, we do have a really significant proportion of um, Americans that come to our museum to visit our exhibit. And so the data that are presented here are from a June 2019 Gallup poll. Um, this Gallup poll has been administered since 1982. Um, and that's when Gallup began asking this question using this wording. What, which of the following statements comes closest to your views on the origin and development of human beings? And so there's three choices. Um, 
in 2019, it was the first time that belief in God's direct creation of man or humans has not been the most common response um, of Americans. And so um, even now, about 40% of US adults ascribe to a pretty strictly creationist view of human origins, believing that God created humans in their present form within roughly the past 10,000 years. But more Americans continue to think that humans evolved over millions of years, either with God's guidance, um, as of the last poll, that was about 33%, and you can see that in the um, bright green line in the middle. Um, the gray line in the top is that majority view, and then or increasingly without any divine involvement at all, and that's that gray line on the bottom. Um, so the 22% of Americans in 2019 who um, do not believe God had any role in human evolution. This really marks a record high dating back to 1982. Um, the wording in this question, I think even in itself is problematic, um, but it's, it's at least kind of a long-term data set that we can use to track US public acceptance of human evolution. Um, the graph on the right is from an article by Miller, Scott and Okamoto in 2006 that was published in Science. Um, so they asked people in 34 countries uh, this question or this or whether they agree with this statement. Human beings, as we know them, developed from earlier species of animals. And so in those 34 countries, the blue bars on the left represent people that thought that was true. That sort of yellow or brownish bar in the middle are people that said that they weren't sure. And the red bars on the right are people that think that this is false. Um, so where does the U.S. fall? We're down here. Um, in uh, 2006, we were second only to Turkey in um, a low acceptance of human evolution. So this is the cultural context in which I think about the communication of human evolution within the U.S. So, but there are some data that U.S. teaching of human evolution is maybe improving. Um, and this was a paper that was published very recently based on a 2019 survey commissioned by the National Center for Science Education. Um, and the survey was conducted by Penn State under the direction of Eric Plesser. Um, and it was really designed to replicate a 2007 survey. Um, and um, the data from the, this survey is elaborated in an article by Eric Plutzer, Glenn Branch, and Ann Reed, published in the journal Evolution, Education, and Outreach. And the article is called Teaching Evolution in U.S. Public Schools, a Continuing Challenge. Um, the average number of hours teaching evolution was 9.8 hours in 2007. Um, in 2019, it was 12.4 hours. So that's a gain of over 25%. And this was largely driven by an increase in the number of teachers reporting devoting 10 or more hours to teaching evolution. So that's good news. And even better news about teaching human evolution. And so they found there was a 60% increase in the mean number of class hours reported as being devoted to human evolution by high school biology teachers from 4.1 to 7.7 .7 class hours from 2007 to 2019. So I think this is Good news. So what's our approach at the Smithsonian? We really seek to go beyond the conflict mode of thinking about the relationship of science and society, particularly science and religion. We're dedicated to fostering inclusive dialogue on science and society topics in a manner that's, contra that's conversational, um, respectful, with cultural awareness and sensitivity and welcoming to all audiences. And we're also interesting in dispelling some misconceptions, such as that all evolutionary scientists are atheists or anti-religion, that evolutionary scientists are somehow trying to disprove the existence of God, or on the other side, that all people of faith are anti-evolution and that acceptance of evolution necessitates the abandonment of faith. So I think addressing these and dispelling these misconceptions is an important part of our communication efforts. What we don't do is what we know doesn't work in um, science communication, and that's the information deficit model. That model assumes that the reason that someone in your audience doesn't accept science is because they just don't know enough of it. So if you throw more scientific information at them, they will love science. There's a lot of great data out there from science communication studies that say that it doesn't work. It's not just about understanding the science. 
it goes deeper than that and it's about worldviews. So I'm gonna talk about how we approach this um, on site uh, in our public programs, which will resume hopefully. Our museum has finally reopened a couple of days ago um, post COVID, but we haven't resumed our public programs yet. But during normal times, um, I run two on-site public programs at the National Museum of Natural History in the Hall of Human Origins. One is a scientist is in a program. And this is a very informal conversational program that happens twice a month. And this involved a scientist, often a graduate student, if I can swing it, um, standing in a mobile cart um, and with objects and interacting informally with visitors as they're walking through the exhibition. Um, I will offer informal coaching for participants who haven't done these sorts of programs before. Um, you see pictured here Vance Powell, who is a recent PhD graduate from George Washington University. And it's really an opportunity for visitors to be able to engage with scientists as people ask them questions um, and have more of an informal conversation. Um, so, there was an evaluation that the museum conducted of the scientists in program, um, both in the Hall of Human Origins and the Ocean Hall. And you can see here um, another one of our participants, Amy Peterson, who's actually now um, a deep time educator for the National Museum of Natural History. So visitors only spend a little more than four minutes engaging in this program. So that's something important for our um, program participants to remember. We don't have a lot of time in which to communicate what we're interested in communicating. But 88% of visitors naturally approach the cart and initiate their engagement with the scientist. 94% of them display nonverbal signs of engagement with the program. They're nodding, they're laughing, they're pointing, they're exhibiting focused listening. 47% of them verbally express awe and wonder. And this was part of a, an evaluation framework that the museum is using at the time. Um, and 67% demonstrate curiosity by, by asking at least one question. Oops. Um, and really importantly, I think visitors who participate in this program, who basically talk to a scientist as they're walking through our exhibit, are significantly more likely to rate their general science interest high than people who don't engage with the scientist. They're also significantly more likely to say that they enjoy studying science, they would like to be a scientist, than are visitors who don't engage with a scientist. So actually just having a scientist in the space talking with visitors can make a really big impact. I also host a program called Hot or Human Origins Today Topics. Um, and so these programs are once a month um, and they're still informal, but they involve an expert making brief introductory comments. So they're an hour long. So maybe the first 10 or 15 minutes is um, an expert just verbally talking about um, their particular science or about a science and society topic. And then they lead a Q&A or a discussion with the audience. Again, this is not a presentation, there are no slides. Um, and some of these programs are led by members of our broader social impacts committee. This is an advisory group to us in the Human Origins Program, comprised of people from diverse religious communities, including scholars, practitioners, educators from around the US. Um, and they assist us in public communication and dialogue surrounding our exhibit and outreach efforts. Some of the topics that we've had for these hot topic events include evolution in the evangelical community, the biology and theology of race and diversity in modern humans, dialogue on science and scientific and societal perspectives on the future of the planet, Native American perspectives on humanity's relation to the earth, um, as well as really hot topics like genetics and human disease and tracing human origins and migration with DNA. Again, an informal presentation that tends to be very visitor led. So that's what we do in the Hall of Human Origin. But recognizing that not everyone can come to visit us in DC, um, several years ago, we launched a traveling library exhibition. Um, and this, the goal of this exhibit is to promote a national conversation on human evolution by touring the Smithsonian's Hall of Human Origins to public libraries. And we partnered with the American Library Association for this effort, and we are still partnering with them. Um, and the initial tour was funded by the John Templeton Foundation. So between April 2015 and April 2017, our traveling library exhibit, which is about a 10% size footprint of compared to our uh, permanent exhibit. Um, so the small traveling exhibit went to 19 public libraries across the US. And you can see the locations of those libraries um, in the map here. Um, libraries had to apply to the American Library Association 
to be chosen to be one of the host sites. Um, and we deliberately wanted to make sure that at least half of the libraries were in what they self-identified as a challenging community in which to display evidence about human evolution. Maybe that was because of religious resistance. Maybe that was because of changing demographics of the community and talking about how immigration has kind of affected their local community. Um, and so um, you can see at every library that applied also had to uh, propose a kind of um, panel that they would work with. We suggested that they work with um, local religious leaders, local civic leaders, local educators. Um, and I'll talk about what kinds of programs that they put on. The aspirations of this project were to make the fossil archaeological and genetic evidence on which the scientific narrative of human evolution is built accessible to new and local audiences. We were also very interested in nurturing local community conversations about the science and the diverse perspectives that people bring to the idea of human evolution. And we wanted to foster connections between the scientific information and the ways in which people form meaningful understandings of the world. So there were four of us from the Smithsonian away team, as we jokingly called ourselves, that actually traveled to every one of the 19 public libraries at least once. Um, and we had four programs that we put on in each library. The first one was a science program. It was more like a traditional lecture. Um, and this was that the title of it was Exploring Human Origins, What Does It Mean to Be Human? Um, and this lecture was given by traveling exhibit curator, Dr. Rick Potts. He talked about the latest research in human evolution and provided an overview of the exhibit's themes and messages. But even in this program, the, there was an initial interactive conversation that invited the audience to offer their own perspectives on the exhibit's theme, what does it mean to be human, which is a, deliberately a question. Um, and then the talk explored how fossils, archaeological finds, and genetic studies can shed light on our connection with the natural world and the origins of sharing, caring, and innovation. We also had a public community conversation, sort of like a town hall meeting. Um, and the title of this was Exploring the Meanings, plural, of Human Evolution, a Community Conversation. This was led by Drs. Connie Burka and Jim Miller, who are the co-chairs of that broader social impact committee that I mentioned. And this program aimed to explicitly address the variety of religious and cultural perspectives that can intersect with scientific findings on human evolution, and really to create room for discussions through civil and open and honest dialogue that invites the public to voice their personal insights about this topic. Um, and particularly, we sought to explore with these public audiences the idea that scientific and religious perspectives on human evolution need not inherently conflict. We also had held two private events or invitation only events really. The first one was a clergy tour and discussion. Um, and so this was a special event for religious leaders and prominent members of local faith communities on the topic of human evolution. Um, so Rick Potts gave a tour of the exhibit um, and following that all four of us led a discussion with local clergy and religious leaders about questions that the exhibit might raise for their communities but also really seeking to articulate points of interest and where we might share some common questions. Um, and this event also introduced the clergy to the work of the broader social impacts committee and resources that they've developed at the intersection of science, evolution, human origins, and religious faith. I then led a workshop for local science educators, and this was open to K to 16 teachers, informal science educators, and homeschoolers. And this workshop provided educators an opportunity to talk about their experiences, their conflicts, their apprehensions, as well as the opportunities they found in teaching human evolution in whatever their setting is that they're teaching. It also gave us an opportunity to introduce them to online print um, and to online to print and other resources that we made available to them and their students. And you can see in this picture, there are a few skull replicas in this on the middle of this round table. And so part of the funding for this traveling exhibit included um, developing this set of skull replicas that was left in every single library, basically as a resource for teachers to check out. So I developed a lesson plan around the five particular skulls that we um, left in their libraries. 
um, so that the teachers could lead hands-on activities, whether it was with kindergartners or middle schoolers or high schoolers. Um, and one of my favorite memories really from these workshops is um, a homeschooling dad who whose daughter is, was fascinated by human evolution. Um, she used these five skulls to develop a 4-H project, went to a national competition, and a couple years later was able to visit the Smithsonian and I could meet her in person. And it was just, it was wonderful. The libraries, excuse me, also put on their own programs at least once a week. And so part of the library uh, application was talking about the kinds of programs that they plan to develop. These were things like film series, book discussions. There was lots of cave paintings that kids could do, putting handprints on the wall, um, and other great creative art-oriented programs for kids. So I could tell you a little bit about our visitor data. And so we worked with Slover Lynette Audience Research to conduct an independent evaluation of the project. Um, and they, uh, they documented over 200,000 visitors um, to the exhibit. Um, including people who engaged in these programs. Um, there were 291 total programs, including the ones that we put on in the library and the ones that the librarians put on themselves. And there were over 1,700 class visits. Um, and over 180 classrooms even use the project theme, what does it mean to be human, to talk about human evolution or to visit the exhibit. So what was the public response? This is, we had these visitor comment forms, and this will always be my favorite visitor comment form. It says, best exhibit ever. The skulls were great, and I love the timeline. And the skulls, I don't know what to say, but I love them. So I think that's actually pretty emblematic of the public response. Um, another way that we were able to gauge that was through sticky notes. And so we had a panel in the exhibit that says, what does it mean to be human? And we asked the library to leave out sticky notes with pens or pencils so that visitors could write their answers to that question. Um, we got a few things that were bordering on doctoral dissertations, um, but most of them were pretty concise answers and they were incredibly thoughtful and they were about all kinds of things about what it means to be human. Um, I particularly like this one. Thank you, Green County Library, for having the courage to bring this exhibit to the Bible Belt. Wonderful. A great teaching moment for my kids. Um, so that was from a library in Missouri that called themselves, uh, that they said they were situated in the buckle of the Bible Belt. Oh, and I should say that there were over 7,300 in sticky notes that all of the library patrons contributed. And there is a page on our website that will be shared afterwards where you can actually go to um, each library section on our website and read what everybody in that section wrote, um, how they responded to the question, what does it mean to be human? So um, Slover Lynette also collected evaluation data um, and they surveyed over 2000 visitors. And of those visitors that they surveyed, about a third of them basically held beliefs that rejected outright um, evolution or were skeptical about evolution by natural processes, basically as an adequate explanation of human origin. So they had an, an anti-evolution worldview, I would call it. But of this subsample of people who rejected evolution, 73% said, said they still enjoyed the exhibit or the program that they attended. 59% agreed with the statement that scientific research on human evolution can enrich our understanding of what it means to be human. 58%, more than half of people with an anti-evolution worldview thought that their faith or worldview could coexist with the idea that humans have evolved over time. 53% thought that the exhibit or program presented human evolution in a way that was respectful of their beliefs. 40% were interested in further discussing the topic of human evolution with friends or family. That doesn't, that may not seem like a big number, but we were absolutely thrilled about 40% of the people who don't have an, uh, don't embrace evolution. 26% said that they shared with others their own views on human origins or human evolution. And only 10% thought that the exhibit or program was trying to change their mind about something they do not believe. Only 10% of those who reject evolution. So we were really happy with these evaluation results. So in summary, we found that respectful, open conversations prevailed, particularly in the 
um, programs where we were able to model those respectful open conversations ourselves. We found that sometimes people who rejected or were skeptical about evolution actually engaged more intensely with the exhibit and our programs. But we also found that sometimes people who felt that they were knowledgeable about human evolution still held some common misconceptions about it. We also found, um, and we were really happy with this finding, that people are looking for a deep level of conversation. And as I mentioned before, they were usually able to model this conversation in a productive way. Um, and their comments and interactions um, were, uh, when we set the tone to have a respectful conversation, they followed suit. What's our next stop for this project? So in 2019, we ran a pilot um, at seminaries. So from January to August, our traveling exhibit was at Payne Theological Seminary in Wilberforce, Ohio. And the picture here is from the opening of the exhibit in Payne Seminary. This is an African Methodist Episcopal Seminary, and it is the oldest freestanding African-American seminary in the United States. From September to December of 2019, the exhibit was at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, which is a Presbyterian seminary. Both of these seminaries designed um, semester-long classes around the exhibit. They were able to bring lots of um, seminary students and faculty and other visitors to the exhibit. So we're really excited post-COVID to be able to continue this project, hopefully having the exhibit visit both public libraries and seminaries. So the last example that I'll talk about is a project that I lead on teaching evolution in US high school classrooms. And so we know that there are lots of factors, um, pedagogical factors, philosophical factors, political, social factors that can contribute to an anti-evolutionary worldview. And we know that cultural and religious objections by some people to the teaching of evolution can negatively impact students' willingness to even engage the topic. However, this project, we developed a hypothesis that using human examples to teach evolution will increase students' understanding, acceptance, and interest in human evolution. So why is that? There were, there's been um, a, a good amount of research at the college level that framing evolutionary scenarios in terms of humans, which you see on the top, as opposed to fruit flies, which you see on bottom, produce fewer conceptual errors. Maybe that's because also documented at the college level, people can see variation from one person to another more easily in humans than among other animals. And students who appreciate the extent of individual level variability are more likely to correctly understand natural selection. So the goals of this, pro oh, sorry. So as I mentioned um, about previous attitudes towards evolution, many, many students hold these worldviews that preclude acceptance of evolution, and they're unlikely to learn about evolution until these worldviews are explicitly addressed, rather than ignoring them in the classroom to actually bring them up and have a conversation about them. And that acknowledging the controversy, as in a social controversy, not a scientific controversy about evolution, and fostering positive dialogue seem to be the most effective instructional methods for teaching evolution as a potentially, again, socially controversial issue. So our project goals were to create and field test a set of human evolution-centered curriculum mini units to align with the advanced placement biology learning objectives. They were scientifically rigorous and accurate and relevant to students. And this effort was led by curriculum developer, Paul Beardsley. Um, and we chose AP Biology. Actually, I'll mention that in the next slide, why we chose AP Biology. We also wanted to, I think the most innovative part of the project, is to create and field test a set of cultural and religious sensitivity teaching strategies to provide teachers with strategies to create a supportive classroom environment for the teaching of evolution and a support and understanding of the nature of science. And this effort was led by Connie Bertka. Finally, we evaluated the effect of using the curriculum units with and without these strategies to un, um, and how that affected student understanding and acceptance of evolution. So these are the covers of our four curriculum units that were developed for AP Biology. Um, and we chose advanced placement biology because in 2011, when I was writing the grant proposal, and I should say that this project was funded by the National Science Foundation, um, uh, 
there was a major curriculum redesign of AP biology. And this is a high level US um, high school biology class where evolution is one of the four big ideas and is about 25% of the AP exam. So there's standard content and a national test. Um, and the three topics, the three covers that you see on the left are adaptation to altitude, the evolution of human skin color, and malaria. And that's about human and malarial parasite um, coevolution. They're really about natural selection in modern humans. Um, and the one on the right, what does it mean to be human? You might recognize that phrase by now. That's kind of our catchphrase in the human origins program. Um, that's about relatedness and phylogeny. And so we picked these, we wanted to pick topics that had robust science content so that we could use them for a long period of time, but also offered a high potential to engage and excite teachers and students because it's relevant to their lives. Um, any teachers who are out there listening, if you're interested in downloading these materials, you can find them for free at bit.ly slash teach human evolution. Um, so we'd love for you to continue to use our materials. So now we'll talk about the CRS, the Culture and Religious Sensitivity Teaching Strategies resource. The purpose of this resource was to encourage and help equip high school teachers to promote positive dialogue around the topic of evolution in their classrooms. And particularly to create a greater under, uh, to create an environment that allows for a greater understanding of science by helping teachers to acknowledge and manage any controversies that arise in the classroom. But the purpose of this resource is not for the teachers to resolve any conflict that the student might have between their own worldview and the science of human evolution, but really just to help create a non-threatening classroom environment where these conversations can be had. The contents of this resource, um, it includes foundational information to help teachers feel more confident about responding to questions, information about the nature of science, about the range of creationist beliefs, about the idea that just because a student um, is a person of faith doesn't mean that they necessarily hold an anti-evolution worldview, um, about the variety of possible relationships between science and religion and that they need not inherently conflict, and then about legal cases dealing with the teaching of evolution in public high school biology classrooms. We also created two classroom activities. Um, the first one was a directed discussion called Why Study Evolution? And this was designed to be introduced before the evolution curriculum unit, particularly in areas with high resistance to learning evolution. Um, and so in brief, basically the students complete an assignment before the class meets that provides insight into their current knowledge and concerns about evolution. And the questions are particularly framed about what might, what concerns might you have or might someone else have about evolution? So it sort of puts the pressure off the student to talk about their own personal concerns if they're not comfortable doing that. And then afterwards in small group and class discussions, Students explored the nature of science. They explored these possible relationships between science and religion. So they were asked to classify statements into, does this statement think that science and religion are in conflict? Are they separate or do they interact? For a lot of students, anything besides conflict was new to them. Um, and then it ended with talking about how evolutionary theory is a tool that biologists can use to solve problems and construct testable hypotheses. The second classroom activity was a historical role play called How Do People Think About Evolutionary Theory? This was designed to be introduced after the evolution curriculum unit in areas with lower resistance to learning evolution, kind of as a summative activity. And so in brief, students were assigned one of eight historical characters and the characters were in pairs um, and they worked in groups to envision how their character would reply to questions about Darwin's theory of evolution. Every pair had a proponent of evolution and someone who either was against it or just didn't understand it. And then these pair of characters worked together. They drafted both a historical response to concerns about evolution, as well as a modern day response, knowing what we know now about evolution. Um, Students love this activity. Everybody wanted to be Darwin and like come in with cotton balls on their face and a big long beard, but um, they, they had a really good time with this role play activity. So from the education research perspective, we um, use various quantitative and qualitative measures to look at student understanding and student acceptance. Um, but I'm just gonna show you some data from two of them. The first is the ACORNS, um, and these measures were all published and validated. And so the ACORNS was developed by Ross Neem, and, uh, who's a professor in the Stony Brook Department of, Col of Ecology and Evolution. Um, he's a member of the graduate program in science education. He's the PI of the Biology Education Research Lab at Stony Brook. 
And then we use the gene. Um, and this was a measure published by Mike Smith. He's a professor of medical education and the director of the AIDS education and research in the Department of Community Medicine at Mercer University School of Medicine. So we use these um, published assessments um, during the 2013 to 2014 school year where we, in, where we um, tested these materials in 10 schools in eight states, including California, Connecticut, Colorado, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Utah, and Virginia. And we had a mix of teachers in public and private schools in urban, suburban, and rural areas. Um, so there were a, a little more than 300 students who field tested these materials with us. So what were the results? Um, in brief, um, so these are the understanding results. That's that ACORNS test. So the light pink bars are pre-test and the brown bars are post-test. So for all of these teachers, except for one, um, student understanding increased. So we gave them the assessment before and after the unit and their understanding of evolution increased. So that was a positive result. Um, and this is the attitude assessment that Gene, we were actually, a, and, and light blue is before the, um, the unit and dark blue is after. We were actually a little bit concerned because um, AP biology students generally have a very high acceptance of evolution. And so the mean pretest scores were quite high. So we know that the, we knew that the potential for significant gain in attitude or acceptance was um, maybe limited, but we still found statistically that student acceptance increased. And this was a really cool result. So we looked at the effect size of the changes in both understanding and acceptance, understanding measured by the acorns and acceptance measured by the gene. Um, and effect size is basically a quantitative measure of the strength of the phenomenon. It standardized the measure of the effect. Um, and so we found particularly in the classrooms that use those CRS activities. Um, so the one with those single asterisks, those classrooms use CRS activity one, the directed discussion, and with two asterisks, those use CRS activity two, the historical role play. In those classrooms in particular, um, we found a higher in, like increase in both in the student understanding in particular. So we think that the CRS activities the in-classroom activities can pave the way for even higher student understanding. That was a very exciting result. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of information about student feedback on these themes. The students thought that these activities, um, the first activity, sorry, the directed discussion, encouraged respectful classroom discussion and reduced tension around the topic of evolution. It increased the awareness of the possibility of non-conflict between evolution and religious beliefs. The activity encouraged reflection on students' own views, as well as understandings of the views of their classmates. And there were varying thoughts around about the appropriateness of the activity for the science classroom. Some students thought, this is introducing non-scientific information in the classroom. But interestingly, when we did focus groups with the students, there were always students to say like, this was really important to me and to be able to grapple with this. So um, we really enjoy kind of listening in on those conversations. I really like this teacher feedback um, and on CRS activity one. And so this teacher said, this is the first time I've taken class time to address the question, why study evolution? In years past, I took for granted that everyone was on board and if, there were, if they were not, there was not much I could do about it. Um, I appreciate the way this structured lesson helped me slow down and acknowledge that certain people have doubts about the evidence for evolution. Those doubts should not have to be muffled. There is space for such dialogue without diminishing the significance of evolution for the study of biology. I don't think we could have asked for better feedback. Um, for student, for activity two, that role play, this, the activity was positively anticipated by most students. They thought this was going to be a lot of fun. Um, and they thought it was helpful for understanding the variety of views about evolution and religion. The students, it also helped the students recognize that the topic of evolution is uncomfortable for some people. Um, we published um, some of the results in two um, freely accessible papers in Evolution Education and Outreach, which you can see here. Um, also, one of the links that will be shared after the lecture um, includes a page on our website that describes the project and these results. And we also published some of the quantitative, the, the top article using human case studies to teach evolution in high school AP biology classrooms includes some of those quantitative results. 
And the bottom one, acknowledging students' concerns about evolution, a proactive teaching strategy, really focuses on the qualitative results and the student focus groups. Um, and we also have a, a book chapter, which includes some more of the quantitative data. So what's our next stop with this project? Um, thanks to um, additional NSF funding, um, Teaching Evolution for Human Examples is now LUDA, Learning, Unity, and Diversity in Alabama. So we are revamping the curriculum materials and the CRS resource going from AP Biology to Introductory High School Biology, which I found out as I was writing the grant proposal is the last science class that the majority of US adults will take, ninth grade biology. We created an entire curriculum unit to kind of ensure that this was the only thing that students were gonna learn in their classrooms about evolution. And we created a parallel unit, one that included human examples and one that didn't. And we're doing all of the field testing and implementation in Alabama. In 2015, Alabama adopted new state science standards that explicitly include evolution for the first time, but they still have warning stickers on their biology textbook that evolution is just a theory. Um, so the map here, you can see the red pins in the map are our field test teachers. We did two years of field testing with a smaller group of teachers to help us refine the materials. And the blue pins are our, um, the addition of our implementation teachers. We're working with almost 40 teachers in Alabama. In February 2020, we had our kickoff workshop with the 40 teachers and everybody had the materials and they were ready to go implement and then COVID hit. So we are um, getting ready this summer to restart the project and we're looking forward to doing our final implementation year next school year. So very quickly, the last thing I wanna talk about, um, again, underscoring the approach of conversation. Um, so this is a kind of my, my reproduction of a graph from an article, um, a, a study led by Susan Fisk in the Department of Psychology at Princeton University, um, a paper in Trends in Cognitive Sciences from 2007, and her group has published similar papers since. Um, and so they did a survey of people about different professions, um, and they looked at these universal dimensions of social cognition, warmth, and confidence. So people perceived as warm and competent, they elicit positive emotions and behavior. People perceived as lacking warmth and confidence elicit uniform negativity. Scientists are perceived as what they called competent but cold. And this combination tends to elicit resentment and envy instead of sympathy and trust. So as scientists were really focused on expertise, but we often neglect this trust factor in communicating science. And people most often trust members of their own group with whom they already know they share values, but for strangers, warmth is the quickest path to trustworthiness. We really need to take emotions and values into account when we do communication. Um, interestingly, for those of you who teach, teachers are score high on both the warmth and competence uh, dimensions. The last thing I want to do is talk, is give you two quick stories about how I put these um, principles into practice. And so this is a great sign from the effort of public library in Pennsylvania when our traveling library exhibit was there. What is human evolution? What does it mean to be human? Come talk about it. So when we were on our traveling library tour, I was um, in one of the public libraries. I was giving a tour to a group of librarians and there was a high school age kid that came in to the library, sat down to do his homework. Um, didn't know that the exhibit was there, didn't know what was going on, but I saw him start to listen in when I was giving this tour. And at the end of the tour, he came up to me and said, can I, can I ask you a couple of questions? And I said, sure. And so he proceeded to ask me questions, which I very much recognized that were typical kind of anti-evolution questions. But I also realized that he was really sincerely grappling with these questions. So I listened, I gave him the best answers I could, I validated his concerns and his fears. And in the end, he just said to me, I really appreciate you talking to me because I've never been able to ask anybody these questions before. So just making a safe space to ask questions is really important. And I really think a lot about, yes, as, as science educators, our goal is science literacy, but I think having a science friendly public is also maybe even a more important goal. My second story that I wanna talk about is I was doing, I was the expert as in um, for a program in the National Museum of Natural History, but not in the Hall of Human Origins. This was um, 
the Bearded Lady Project exhibit, which is um, talking about um, women in science, basically, and the experiences of women in science. And so I had some objects out related to my research, but I also had um, printouts of photos of me pregnant in the field, me bringing my son to the field. And so a mom and her two daughters, I would say, probably one was elementary and one was middle school, um, came up and approached the card and they started asking me questions. And the mom said, oh, so you believe in evolution. And immediately my goals for this interaction shifted. It was not about touch this amazing one million year old fossil bone that has butchery marks on it. Um, it was not about talking about the intricacies of my research. It was about connecting with this other mob to talk about, you know, what's it like, how's her visit to DC? What's it like to, you know, bring her girls along with her? Um, and finding places of connection, making a human connection with someone, finding something in common with her. That was my goal for the interaction with her is to make her feel heard and validated and that she had a personal conversation with a scientist. For her daughters, I was particularly interested in talking about how fun it was to be a scientist, how much I like my job. Um, I was interested in making science accessible to them, thinking, and I really wanted them to go away from the interaction thinking like, oh, I met a scientist. She seemed to really like her job. And maybe that's something that I could do when I grow up. So I want to stop there and make sure that we have some time for questions. And again, thank you to the Leakey Foundation for inviting me to give this talk. And thank you to everybody in the audience for coming. Thank you so much, Brianna. That was an amazing talk. Now we'll be taking some questions from the audience. If you haven't gotten your question in, please be sure to get your question into the chat now. I also want to remind you if you have been enjoying this talk and are watching us on YouTube to subscribe to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel. And if you're watching us on Facebook or Twitter, please follow us and um, you'll get notifications of all of our upcoming programs. So um, thank you. Um, now let's take our first question from the audience. Patrick asks, what have you seen as one of the biggest determinist challenges to educating the public about human origins today? That's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple of them. One is that um, human origins can be a high hurdle. Um, for acceptance of evolution. So I think that the, some of the traditional things that I mentioned about resistance from a religious perspective or a cultural perspective, but also evolution is just complicated to understand. Um, and so I think from a just a simple like cognitive perspective, also unfortunately, in, and this isn't unique to human origins, but science has been politicized. And so I think, um, for people that feel like, well, I, I can't engage with the science, I can't accept it because it goes against my general kind of worldview and the group that I belong to. So that to me is a really unfortunate, not so recent, but, you know, kind of it's been an, a more intensified recent trend. Let's take our next question. We have a lot of questions, so we're going to try to get through as many as we can. Um, Dirk asks, how do you convey to people that changes in our understanding of human evolution are the result of new insights rather than scientists not knowing what they are talking about? I definitely get that. I understand this question. And so, you know, some of it, we get frustrated, I think, human evolution scientists when the media is like, well, this overturns everything that scientists thought about human evolution. They didn't know what they were talking about. That's not the case. Most of the time, as in any kind of scientific field, we're really building incrementally on the body of knowledge that we had. So I try really hard to, you know, talk about how a new finding fits in with the general overall narrative. Sure, sometimes a date shifts or sometimes something changes a little bit. But in general, I think that um, communicating that, like, this is part of the, it builds on the body of knowledge that we already had and that, um, also, human evolution is a very fast paced, exciting science. It's very interdisciplinary. And so the fact that there are new discoveries all the time doesn't mean that scientists doesn't know what they're talking about. Scientists don't know what we're talking about. It just it means that there is just all of this unexplored information and, you know, things left to discover. So I try to put that kind of positive spin on it. I know that it can be unsettling for people who really want science to be like, this is a solid body of knowledge and it's never going to change. But I try to capitalize on the positive. Well, the exciting thing about science is that we're finding new things all the time. Absolutely. Let's take our next question from the audience. 
Um, Win asks, how do you respond to the question about whether you believe in evolution? Yeah, great question. And I know other colleagues that, you know, don't really like that language about belief in evolution. So I normally will say, well, I accept the evidence for evolution. So I will, it's not that I will say, well, I don't believe in evolution, but I will change the language to something that I think is more scientific language. Um, and so I had an experience once when I was, I happened to be walking through the Hall of Human Origins, I had to check something that was in the exhibit. Um, and I had my Smithsonian badge on, so it was pretty clear that I, you know, work at the museum. Um, and there was someone standing in front of the big curved skull wall that we have in our exhibit going sort of like, well, I don't, I don't see any evidence for evolution. And I thought, okay, like my favorite part of the exhibit with all this evidence is right in front of you, but I, the most important thing for me to do in that moment was to listen to where this person's um, uh, where this person's fear was coming from. Yeah. And so, yeah, so anyway, but the, the question about do I believe in evolution, I will usually change the language to something that is more scientific. Oh, absolutely. Okay, uh, we'll get our next question from the audience. Let's see here. Um, Shmizi asks, what type of language do you use as to not be exclusive or make it seem like other views are wrong? And how do you include non-Western explanation of human origins? Yeah, great questions. And so I'll, the first, I'll take the second one first. How do I include non-Western explanations? It's <laughs> absolutely something that I try to make sure to talk about that there are a whole variety of different views on human origins and that um, mostly just acknowledging this fact and at least talking about some of the views that I'm familiar with. Um, remind me what the first part of the question was again. because Oh, let's bring it up again. Uh, what type I, of language? Yeah. I have to not be exclusive or make it, it seem like others' views are wrong. So the language I will often use is to just I often invite people to, to like one of the one of my favorite phrases that I say is tell me more about that. And so I try to uncover like where any kind of resistance is coming from. And I will so, I mean, some of the other things I will say is like, you know, that's a really common idea about this. So it's not like you're wrong. And so is everybody else. You know, I won't say things like that. But like, this is a common idea. But this is the way that scientists think about it. This is the kind of evidence that we would look for to answer that question. So trying to do it in a way that isn't dismissive of somebody's viewpoint. There are times that I think you do have to agree to disagree. But when I do that, I try to do it in the most respectful way possible. Oh, absolutely. Okay, let's go. Oh, uh, okay, we have one more question. Um, so um, um, are these programs facilitated with uh, multi-module learning in mind? in order to help reach diverse learning styles and expressions of knowledge? Yeah, great question about multimodal learning. Absolutely. So we do a lot of, obviously, tactile learning with the objects. Um, we often make sure to have visual, um, other like sort of for visual learners and auditory learners. So um, it's something that we've, we haven't, um, we don't necessarily communicate explicitly with our programs, but it is something that we try to think about implicitly. Absolutely. Our next question will be, oh, here we go. Um, Win asks, how does age influence the response to the library exhibits? Oh, how does age influence? That's a good question. Um, oh, I know that we have data on that, um, but I don't remember what those data are. Um, my recollection, though, is it, you may not be surprised that the, the demographics of the visitors to the libraries are like lots of school kids um, and lots of retirees. And so, um, but we, because, because of the nature of doing these surveys, we don't survey anybody who's under the age of 18. Um, and so it's a good question. I, I don't recall if there are big differences in responses to the exhibit within the adults based on age. I would, I would have to go back and look at that. That's a good question, though. I know that they're in, in general, like in the, in the Gallup and Pew poll data, that age does play a factor in acceptance of evolution. So does politics, so does religiosity, so does education. So a lot of these factors kind of interplay. Oh, absolutely. Okay, um, let's, oh, here we go. Um, Camilla, who introduced you, um, asks, why, uh, what five skulls did you leave behind in the libraries? Uh, right, so we, the five skull replicas that we have, um, 
left behind in the libraries. One was an Australopithecus. So there were five different species. Um, one was a Homo sapien skull. Um, one was a Neanderthal skull. One was a Homo erectus skull. One was an Australopithecus africana skull. Oh my goodness. And I'm trying to remember the fifth one. The fifth one I think was a, um, either a home, uh, I think it was a Homo heidelbergensis skull. Um, but I'll have to, I can like picture them, but I, I, I want to make sure that I get that right. So I'll make sure to let you know. Okay. We, we have so many questions coming in. Let, let's, let's try to get through as many as we can. Let's see. What's, ah, uh, Kristen asks, how do you motivate fellow scientists to value public engagement in science? That's a great question. Um, and so I try to do it by overwhelming them with my enthusiasm for it. No. <laughs> um, so, well, part of it is I try to do it by, you know, um, Science can be a very isolating experience. And so it can be a really validating experience to do public engagement. You get great feedback from people. Um, I also think that um, the experience of doing any kind of public engagement can really translate to writing grant proposals, to um, you know, writing scientific articles. I use the same kind of communication skills um, to try to make sure that I'm communicating clearly even to my scientific colleagues. So I think it's really trying to, it can be those personal um, like kind of validating experiences, but also the skills you, you cultivate and build in science communication can be incredibly useful in just even in your scientific career, collaborating with other people, making your ideas known clearly. Oh, absolutely. And see here. Um, uh, Katie asks uh, if interpersonal co conversations are crucial to increase acceptance of evolution, given the ratio of general public to uh, evolutionary scientists. This can almost feel um, Sisyphean. Sisyphean. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Katie, I, how do you sustain your energy and motivation for this work? Thanks, Katie. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, it can, because really, it's like I can't go out and talk to everybody. Um, but the more of us that have conversations with the person sitting next to us on the plane going to a conference that, you know, in the grocery store, in, you know, at your kids back to school night, I think the energy, obviously I'm an extrovert, the energy also that I draw from people when I have the, when I do public engagement is really, um, to me, it's very energizing. It's very validating. And even when, if a if an interaction doesn't go well, it's something that I feel like I can learn from. Um, so yeah, it's 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 kind of a it 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 it's a I don't know self fulfilling. It is Sisyphean because we're never I don't know because we're we're I would love to spend you know all of my time on the road talking to the public, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but but I I am just and people ask me this all the time. I'm so heartened by seeing so many more people interested in this kind of work and valuing this kind of work. I think even, I mean, I'm not involved in tenure and promotion decisions, but I think that like that's an area also in academia that we, there's been a little bit of movement on and it's something that we can work on a little bit more about valuing this kind of work. And you talk about getting energy from interacting with people and I, I completely agree it, you know, being someone who organizes and hosts events, um, but it's got it's very different with COVID not to have that in person interactions. Uh, how are you finding that? Yeah, it's a good question. It's been tough for sure. Um, I mean, we so the only program that we're new that we're doing consistently online with the with the um, Human Origins program is these hot topic events. And so we once a month um, we do um, these. We pivoted these hot topic events to online. The fun thing about that for me is that while we do them in this kind of similar format where I can't see everybody's face, but still I can look through the participant list and go like, oh my gosh, there are 200 people here. When we do this program in the museum, sometimes there are 10 or 15 and sometimes yeah. there are more. Um, so it's been tougher, but I think the, the broader and more international reach of being able to do public programs virtually has been really rewarding. Oh, absolutely. Let's take our, our next audience question. Uh, John asks, what do you see as the future of human evolution education, both in the formal and informal universes? Uh, great question, John. I would say you are the future as a middle school science teacher because I know John very well. Um, so I think, it's a great question. I think um, what I've seen um, more of my colleagues do about trying to make the 
stories more accessible, trying to make the evidence more accessible. Um, you know, I am excited to see more. I think, I think we need to also think about um, producing um, educational materials where people are already, videos, books. Um, you know, when I've been reading a little bit more about like the sort of the kind of media that people consume and we, we need to, you know, as Leaky Foundation is doing too, like doing videos, doing podcasts, um, putting things out there where people, even in spaces where people already are. And as much as it may feel like Katie said, that the Sisyphe intact, having conversations in public libraries in others, like those, it, it, it's a slow and steady, you know, spark that may change somebody's feelings and attitudes about evolution. And those are all worth it. When you don't realize sometimes how the impact uh, might might not take hold at first, you know, but it'll be down the road. Um, okay, let's take our next um, our next audience question. Um, Alexa asks, what do you say? Um, how do you deal with people who are flat out refused to even have an open dialogue on human evolution or who bring a core uh, confrontational attitude? Yeah, that's a great question and it's a tough one. Um, I mean, I like to think of engagement and audiences on a spectrum. And so like, do I really wanna bang my head against the wall and spend a lot of time at the end of the spectrum where someone's not interested in engagement? Um, most of the time with those sorts of people or audiences or interactions, all I wanna do is have them leave the interaction feeling that I have been respectful and that I have been honest and that I have been um, human. And so I'm not necessarily going to budge somebody along the continuum of understanding or acceptance or something like that. But I want them to leave not having a negative interaction with the scientist. So uh, it's really about figuring out what your goal is depending on who your audience is. So our next question. Uh, Christina asks, are we struggle, uh, as we struggle in the U S with teaching and acknowledge the history of systemic racism, I think teaching about our common origins out of Africa can only help. Do you incorporate any of uh, teaching on race? That is an excellent question and something I've been thinking a lot about recently. Um, so yes, one of those, um, teaching um, curriculum units is about the evolution of human skin color, which is obviously not the same thing as race, but it is an outward visible um, means of understanding human diversity. Um, I, um, and so we've also been talking among the members of the broader social impacts committee about sort of expanding the remit of that committee to thinking about engagement on race. Um, I'm working on a project right now with Howard Hughes Medical Institute with Connie Burka um, and a, a few other people um, that is developing sort of best practices for teaching controversial science topics. And we are planning on talking about how do you teach about race in the classroom. Um, and so um, Brian Donovan is a wonderful um, researcher who's done a lot of excellent quantitative research on how do you do this in a way where you don't, um, where you do good and make sure not to do harm. Um, also the Smithsonian's national, um, the NAMAC, the National Museum of African American History and Culture has fantastic resources on talking about race. Um, so I think it's a, a really good opportunity to really cross that boundary between science and other aspects of society and education, because it's really, um, you know, you cannot just teach, I think, about the science when you're thinking about about race. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We have another. Uh, uh, Rob asks, um, to what extent do you see challenges, evidence-based approaches around evolution engagement as applying or not to other science and society types, vaccines, climate change, animal testing? Yeah, it's a great question, Rob. And so I've particularly been thinking about this with this, with this work I'm doing with Howard Hughes Medical Institute and thinking about we're, we're trying to develop some resources and hopefully eventually a professional development, um, you know, opportunity for teachers around all of these sorts of topics. There are some common threads, but there are also some unique aspects of each of these 
quote unquote controversial science topics. And so with evolution, traditionally the resistance has been um, religion. With climate change, traditionally the resistance has been politics and economics. Um, wow, what's going on with vaccines is like from a science communication perspective, fascinating, but from a public health perspective, really frightening. Um, so I think there are some common approaches, but I think it's also important to think about the particular topic and what the kind of pitfall might be and just make sure to be aware of that or, or what the particular point of resistance might be. Um, Elizabeth asks, what are some ways to reach younger children and start to build an understanding of evolution? That's an excellent question. And I think um, you, you may be happy to know that I think books are a great idea. Um, I get asked pretty routinely um, to recommend books about human evolution for younger children. And I think we can, we need more of those. Um, and I think I've also, I mean, even in my local parent Facebook groups, occasionally there's a question of like, my kid is just asking me about where the free first human came from and I don't know what to tell them. Um, and so I think um, thinking about really understandable, approachable ways to communicate with kids about human evolution is important. And I, there are a few good books out there, but I really think that um, there can never be enough of those. So I think particularly because books are such a great learning resource for kids that, and, and videos as well. So. Well, maybe you will share that list with us and we can share it with our viewers. Um, let's see our next question. Let's see here. Um, Jacqueline asks, what do, uh, how do you balance your research and efforts in science communication? What would you recommend for young scholars interested in both, um, especially given the pressure of being academically productive? Oh, this is a great question. One that I get um, often. So I am lucky in the fact that my like job responsibilities entail both. Um, and so I have the privilege of being able to continue to do my science research while I'm doing lots of outreach. Um, I think that to the extent that outreach feeds your soul, um, which I know it does for a lot of people, I think that um, figuring out, everyone's gonna have their own balance of this. And, and I would encourage particularly, you know, early career researchers and younger scholars out there, you can publish on outreach efforts. And so I've seen some great, you know, I've done some of this, I've seen more of my colleagues doing this. And so the efforts that you're doing um, in outreach can be done in sort of a systematic and publishable way. Um, they can, they also don't have to be done that way. They can be done in a way that is just, I'm going to spend, you know, I'm going to volunteer with an organization and I'm going to once a month go and, you know, talk to kids about human evolution. Um, I wish I could answer that question with a formula, but I feel like it changes throughout your career and potentially even in the particular context that you're in. Um, but I would just say, I encourage you, if you really enjoy doing it, to like, to keep doing it. I think we have, uh, is it, uh, we have time for one more question, I think. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, um, Kay Lindsay asks, how can scientists and educators ensure that human evolution education doesn't get lost in the pandemic at home, remote school, post pandemic catch up? Yeah, great question, Lindsay. And so um, the more resources that we develop um, that we make easily accessible to teachers, I think is a great way to do this. And so, um, you know, Leaky Foundation, Our Museum, um, other organizations like CARTA, um, where I know that Lindsay works, that make recorded videos accessible to teachers, that build resources around those videos so that things, so that those kinds of um, resources can be used in the classroom. I think basically packaging things in ways that are easy for teachers to use is a, at least a good start in doing that. Um, I just like to end um, asking, you know, do you have any advice for those watching? We have a lot of scientists and students um, uh, who are considering the career path of studying human evolution. Oh, great question. Do it. If you like it, absolutely pursue it. Um, so I that, that's that's my sage advice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I guess I guess um, the. One of the one of the coolest things about studying human evolution is you can do it in so many ways. You can use an academic research approach, and there you can study fossils, genetics, archaeology, modern humans, physiology, um, development. There's all kinds of ways to study human evolution. You can be a 
like math and numbers person. You can be like me and not be a math and numbers person and collaborate with people who are. Um, you can do field work, you can do lab work. So I think it's just, it's a, there are just, there's opportunities if you're interested in the topic to find the thing that works for you. Um, and so getting, you know, trying to get some experience. And um, I was saying the other day in sort of a career discussion, figuring out what you don't like to do is also just as important as figuring out what you do like to do. So don't be afraid to try something and then just go, mm, I'm not a field person or mm, I'm not going to look at a microscope all day. Um, but um, there are just so many ways to study human evolution. It, it's what makes it one of the most exciting fields of science, I think. Well, thank you so much, Brianna. This was an amazing, um, amazing evening. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation. Thanks to everybody who joined us. And um, it, it was great to be here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some upcoming programs we have, and then we'll say a final goodbye to Brianna um, for, for at least tonight. Um, so up next, the Leakey Foundation is teaming up with several world-renowned human evolution scholars to raise money for the Primate Research Fund through an exclusive summer travel series of programs. Um, you'll be virtually transported to field sites around the world with renowned scholars as your tour guides. Our first one um, is virtually whisks you away to Argentina with Eduardo Fernandez Duque and Claudio Villegia, who are both anthropologists, with a musical performance by um, Guillermo Garcia. Um, next, on July 7th, you will meet um, Michael Petraglia uh, and a master falconer. And then on August 26th, you'll go on a whirlwind tour of Ethiopia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Senegal, and Indonesia with four primatologists who have received funding through the Primate Research Fund. You can attend any one of these exclusive events live for a $100 donation that will be quadruple matched by the by Anna and Jeff Majin Calda and the Anna and Gordon Getty Foundation. Um, or for a $10 donation, you, you can receive a link to any one of these programs. And we will share the link for that in uh, the chat to find out more about that program. You'll be helping protect vulnerable primates, long-term field research sites, and their local staff members, and get an exciting look behind the scenes at some pretty amazing sites. Then next on um, Lunch Break Science on July 1st, we will meet paleoanthropologist, Baldwin Fellowship Scholar, and Leakey Foundation grantee, oh, as well as Dr. Brianna Pobiner's colleague, Habiba Churcher, and learn about what changes in the skeletal anatomy tell us about our ancestors. And if you... Uh, can't satisfy your curiosity, um, you can um, check out the latest episode of Origin Stories podcast, The Obstetrical Dilemma, which features Leaky Foundation grantees Holly Dunsworth and Anna Werner. You can find the Origin Stories podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. So again, Brianna, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was just, again, like absolutely amazing. Uh, I wish we could keep you here for another two hours to answer <laughs> questions, but... Um, Alas. So um, thank you all for watching, um, and especially for those who have donated uh, at the science supporter and evolution enthusiast levels. Thank you so much. And Thanks, have Ariel. a great evening. Good night.